Hi there, I'm Nathan. With spring break right around the corner, more and more people will be taking this opportunity to get out and see the world. And for every mile of road that's traveled over the next few weeks, there'll be somebody along the side of that road advertising some product you just can't see anywhere else that also happens to cost an arm and a leg to get inside. The tourist trap. They may be unpopular, but they're still around, and almost impossible to avoid seeing when you are traveling. But what makes a tourist trap? Sure, we may know what they look like, but is there more to this picture than meets the eye? Is there some deep, dark secret to these tourist traps that we just don't know about? Well, to answer these questions and others, I decided to visit three of Branson, Missouri's most iconic tourist traps to see what makes them operate about two years ago. Look, I'm really behind on making videos, okay? And after visiting these locations and thoroughly reviewing the footage and analyzing what these places have to offer, I think I've got a pretty good idea as to what makes a tourist trap work. Now, if you'd like to know how I decided which of these locations to visit, uh, it's kind of way down in that video there. But if you want to know how this entire experience went, well, buckle up. I need to blow my nose. Now, when I first started planning out this video, I immediately had one location that I wanted to visit. The Ripley's Believe It or Not Auditorium. That was because while I'd heard of this location and was quite familiar with the brand itself, I'd never actually visited any of their locations. Chances are, if you're watching this video and you've been to some major tourist destination, you've probably seen a Ripley's building. And that's not a surprise. This company is massive. Not only do they have locations across the United States, but they've also got them all around the globe. Outside of their signature auditoriums, Ripley's has aquariums, mirror mazes, traveling exhibits, and even owns the attractions rights to the Guinness World Record brand. But despite their extensive reach and massive lineup, the Ripley's brand also has this level of trashiness that comes with it. Maybe it's just because of their facades, which often look cheap, unfinished, and not super aesthetically pleasing, but the content behind those facades also seems to be lacking. As a perfect example of this, back in 2021, I found myself in San Antonio, Texas over spring break. And while I was there, I was met with a Ripley's 4D Theater, a Guinness World Records Museum, a Louis Tussauds Waxworks Museum, also a brand owned by Ripley's, a Ripley's Haunted House Experience, and the Ripley's Tomb Rider Dark Ride, all conveniently located right next door to each other, while also being located directly across the street from the Alamo. The Haunted House and Dark Ride would close in 2022 to be replaced by a future Alamo Visitor Center. So naturally, I had a lot to look forward to with this visit. Keeping with Ripley's themes of not being a high quality experience or whatever, the Branson facade is that of a mansion that seems to have been hit by an earthquake. But much like the brand behind it, the owners of this mysterious mansion decided it'd be a good idea to slap some bright paints on the exterior without doing anything to fix the underlying foundational and structural issues of the entire experience. Something something an allegory. Now this might come as a surprise to you, but I didn't enjoy Ripley's Branson. Shocking, I know. But there's actually a couple of legitimate reasons why. First off, the building is small. This is the largest room in the entire exhibit, and it takes up a fifth or even a quarter of the entire building's space. While that wouldn't be a problem on its own, the space that Ripley's does have isn't always used to its fullest potential. Take this shooting gallery that takes up another decent chunk of space, while also being something that you have to pay to use. Second, the exhibits that Ripley's did have weren't really that good in quality. See the pay-to-play shooting gallery from before. But even the free exhibits weren't necessarily that great. Take this room, where gravity was supposed to be weird. Featuring balls rolling uphill. I said balls rolling uphill. There we go. Surprisingly enough, it actually looks better on camera than it does in person. Or this room that features camera effects? Or this hallway? Or these... 
Okay, let's just address the big elephant in the room here. On their website, Ripley describes the auditoriums as places for people to experience, quote, stories of people and places that are incredibly hard to believe, but undeniably true. While that may be true on paper, in practice, it reminds me less of these incredible stories and just starts to feel like the modern-day equivalent of a circus freak show. And I think that's mostly due to these highly realistic wax figures that I do not want to be standing anywhere near, and this incredibly large reliance on these weird gross-out facts. But it's arguably made worse by some interactives going from kind of okay to borderline cruel. Take this platform here. On the surface, the idea is to give people a chance to step closer and get a better look at Toast Jesus over here. However, when you step onto said platform, the entire thing actually drops. Not enough to kill you or injure you, but enough to give you a potentially minor heart attack. Other interactives in the exhibit share a similar vibe, and as a result, all of these things combined together to create an experience that often feels like all the fun is just being had at the expense of the people paying to get in the door. Fortunately, by the time I'd gotten this all figured out, I was just about at the exit and only had one more room left to This, fuck this, fuck this, fuck this, moving on! While Ripley's would be a very low place to start with on this tour, it meant that things could only go uphill from there. And fortunately for me, the next place that I was going to visit was about to take everything that Ripley's did and do it a whole lot better, while also flipping it all completely on its head. Literally. Alright, I'll see myself out now, thanks for- This is Wonderworks, and there were two major differences that set Wonderworks apart from Ripley's. Space, and theming. According to the lore of Wonderworks, this massive building we're visiting is the Laboratory of Professor Wonder. Originally, it was located somewhere in the Bermuda Triangle, until a freak accident launched the entire thing out of the Bermuda Triangle, catapulted it halfway across the United States, and made it land upside down into a log cabin in the heart of Branson, Missouri. One of the first exhibits you can actually check out when you get into Wonderworks is this really cool projection map thing that tells the story of how this all happened, and gives you a preview of the other exhibits you'll get to experience. Of course, in order for us to actually be able to experience this wonderful lab, we first need to be able to walk on the ceiling. This is a simple solution, as all it requires is a simple trip through the inversion tunnel where, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Wonderworks uses their exhibits to explore scientific principles through interactive hands-on displays. Now, I will admit that some of these exhibits do stress the definition of scientific principles a little bit, like laser tag, but they're still fun, so I approve. And since Wonderworks has three floors of space to play with, it means they're able to do a lot of things that Ripley's could do, but in much better ways. For example, take this one-way mirror gimmick at Ripley's. You first see it when you enter the exhibit, and it advertises itself as an opportunity to practice some weird stuff that you can do with your face. However, once you get to the end, you realize that people could watch you making your funny face the entire time. Wonderworks takes this idea and stretches it out over the entire building. First, it frames these as small, unobtrusive little fun facts about people being able to do things like wiggle their ears. And second, it makes this a reoccurring thing that you see pop up again and again as you're traveling throughout the exhibit. Which means by the time you've gotten to the end and get to see the payoff, first, you're rewarded with more to see, and second, it feels more rewarding because you've seen this built up over the entire exhibit. But there's also just more going on at Wonderworks than in Ripley's. See the aforementioned laser tag. Or this Tesla coil. Or this air hockey table you're supposed to control with your hands but doesn't really work very well. Look, I don't have a lot of footage from Wonderworks, but that's mostly because I was too busy having a lot of genuine fun with some of the exhibits they had to offer. That bulldozer's been doing some work. Last but certainly not least on this tour was my third stop, Beyond the Lens. 
Now, unlike the other two attractions in, that I visited so far, Beyond the Lens is notable because for the first time in this entire video, we're visiting a place that doesn't have destruction happening to a building's facade, we've finally done it. Now, Beyond the Lens focuses on delivering technotainment, whatever that means. And according to their website, they have two locations, one in Branson, Missouri, and the other in Pendigen Forge 10. Oh. Well, at least we don't have to worry about an annoying spinning tunnel like at the other two locations. Uh, this one just uses mirrors and a fancy uh, light projection. Honestly, I'm not really sure what this place has going for a theme. We've got Hollywood signs, dance videos, technology through the ages, and Beat Saber? Okay, maybe they've got at least some good songs. What? Okay, well, maybe technotainment refers to the type of experiences that they have to offer. Like these photo ops. Or maybe it's referring to... Will you excuse me for a moment? What the fuck is this? What the fucking fuck? Who's fucking idea? That's right, folks, we've got a decent section of this building dedicated to the JFK assassination and conspiracy theories around it. I wish I was making this up, why is it here? And if you think the conspiracy theories stop there, you'd be wrong, because there's more. We have an entire section about the potential of the moon landing being faked. Fortunately, they do debunk it in the interactives. A section about Bigfoot, a section about aliens, and a section about Princess Diana that was broken when I was there, but I'm fairly certain that it has something to do with conspiracy theories surrounding her death. Oh yeah, and Michael Jackson's nose is what is going on here. Fortunately for me, there might be one saving grace for this entire experience. Fly Ride. Which also just so happens to be a separately ticketed attraction. Now you're probably thinking, what is Fly Ride anyways? And if you just so happen to guess, a worse version of Soren with a creepier flight attendant, worse visuals, stranger cuts, more annoying music that sounds like this, then you'd be right. Also, I do want to mention there's one specific spot in the, uh, one specific bit in the ride that I find absolutely hilarious. Uh, it's this section where you're, like, seeing this overview of, I think it's like the, Col like, a Colorado River or something. It's like, you're, you're basically, like, this flyover of a group of just, like, rafters, and you're, or, like, people doing rafting and stuff, and you're thinking, wow, that's kind of fun. And then all of a sudden it just jump cuts to you being in the boat. It's so jarring and out of the blue that it legitimately made me laugh out loud. And then they do it again to the other boat. I don't know why. So now that I've visited all three of these locations and lived to tell the tale, I've put together Nathan's three rules of tourist traps, patent pending. Each one of these three rules, in my opinion, perfectly summarizes the essence of the modern tourist trap. Rule number one, you are the loudest person in the room. While this rule might sound simple enough, there's actually a little bit more going on with it. First off, many of these locations aren't relying of word of mouth or major public interest to drive their business. As such, they need to be advertising not only that they exist, but that you should be spending money on them. In some ways, that's using lots of advertising. In other ways, it's standing out visually from the competition. Both ways of being loud ultimately serve the same purpose. Get people in the door. Rule number two, only be as original as you absolutely need to be. Sure, you're trying to get people in the door, but you also want to make sure that your door is the first one they get into. And if you get to get them in their door before they go somewhere else, somewhere better, then you get to set their expectations. After all, if you're all you're doing is ripping off something better, they'll know it is something that you did first, even if that isn't necessarily the case. Rule number three, they pay for what they get. This one is arguably the most important rule of all. Wikipedia notes that tourist traps often derive from the information asymmetry. That's when one party has more or better information than the other between tourists and the market. And in the case of a tourist trap, this information asymmetry creates an inverse of the you get what you pay for. If you want to know what it is you're getting, you need to spend your money up front. Want to see this impressive exhibition with incredible facts? Gotta pay $35 a ticket just to get in the door. Want to know how high quality this Disney t-shirt is? 
Well, you have to buy it first. Want to buy these incredibly cheap theme park tickets? We'll just sign on the bottom line and pay no attention to the terms and conditions at all. You get the idea. Now you might be thinking, but wait, I've been to tourist traps and they didn't always fit those three rules. And here's the thing. At the end of the day, a genuine tourist trap just wants to make money. Sure, it can be easy to see all of these cheesy, attention-seeking pieces of roadside tours and this nothing more than tour straps, but visiting these three locations gave me an opportunity to see just how much more meaningful it can be when something is truly made from the heart. That isn't to say that tourist traps are a bad thing. In fact, some of the best memories I had over that summer was visiting these places with my friends, either from the genuine excitement of really good experiences or the complete and utter bafflement as to what the heck we were experiencing. And that's the real curious case about a tourist trap. The genuine joy that comes from these places isn't from what you're experiencing, but rather who you're experiencing them with. Because at the end of the day, the journey and the people you're taking that journey with is more important than the destination. Still, it's a good idea to read reviews of places before you visit them.